Our focus reading this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Hear these words from Luke 5, 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little away from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night, but we have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, but most important to the doing of God's written words. All right, it's time for the children's time. Those of you watching online, it's your turn too. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I trust you're doing well all the way back there. Thank you for lighting our candles this morning and for what I believe is extinguishing them following service. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. All right. I have a question for you. Have you ever gone fishing? Yeah, two thumbs up there. Fishing. You ever gone fishing? Well, with whom did you go fishing? Parents? Grandparents? Maybe some friends? Maybe by yourself when nobody was looking? You, you, you hooked your own hook? You didn't take the fish off, did you? Y'all don't do that, do you? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, when I was your age, my people took my brother and me fishing. Now, we mostly went fishing at Smith Mountain Lake or at Myrtle Beach from the pier before he died when I was in fifth grade and my brother Bruce was in first grade. We would prepare our coolers with Coca-Cola's, mm, NABs, y'all know what NABs are, I don't know. NABs, apparently they're the, the Nabisco, but it's any, it's any of those crackers that come in a pack of six. I like the orange ones with the peanut butter. We had Coca-Cola, NABs, and a giant pack of peanuts. And my people would un undo the Coca-Cola. He'd take his peanuts and he'd pour them in there. And I thought, what in the world? He said, Craig, you gotta try it. I was like, all right, let me try it. This is amazing. And at the end, the peanuts are sweet with all the syrup. Mm. Delicious. Well, anyway, we'd get those coolers packed. We'd put them into the, into the car. We'd grab people's tackle box, put that in the car, grab our fishing poles, put those in the car. And then we drive that yellow two-door Cadillac with doors as long as the church. Church pew. And we drive to the bait shop, pick up some night crawlers. Y'all know what night crawlers are? That's country talk for worms. We, grip, we grab the worms and finally we make our way to the fishing hole. And we fish till lunch or dinner time. And we had fishing memories that would last a lifetime. Whether or not the fish will bite it. And if you haven't been fishing, then you have to at least try it twice. The first time is all learning. The second time is when it gets fun. And the third time is when you start wasting time. That's for when it gets really good. 
In today's passage, Jesus goes fishing on the lake. Pretty neat, huh? Now, what do you think it would be like fishing with Jesus and his disciples? I mean, I think fishing with Jesus would be so cool, right? I mean, he could walk on water to fix your line if you got tangled, right? Be awesome. He could multiply your snacks if you were running low. Double awesome. Some of the adults might like to know what Jesus could do with water. That's another conversation for another day. In fact, we had it a couple weeks ago. And a few of them, uh, a few of the disciples had boats and nets, which is fun. And it's a lot different than pole fishing, right? Net fishing, ooh, you got to hike them up, squat down, and you got to, woo, got to grab it, heave. I learned that in the Holy Land of all places. On this lake. Pretty neat. According to today's focus reading, though, going fishing with the disciples would have been boring. It would have been boring and tiring. The Bible says they fished all night long, and guess what they caught? Nothing. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. Nothing. Throwing and dragging nets all night can't be that much fun, especially if you're coming up empty-handed every time. Uh, I'm sure Simon and his friends were disappointed, and I'm sure you would be too, right? Yep. Then what happens? You remember? Jesus gets in one of the boats and he starts teaching. And then he tells Simon to try again and go out into the deep water. And Simon has nothing to lose, so he pushes away from shore and he heaves the nets into the deep when suddenly the nets start to break because they have so many fish in there. It's a miraculous catch. There are so many fish that they call for another boat, their partners, to come and help. And eventually, they pulled so many fish in that it almost sunk two of the boats. That's incredible. Boy, that was the worst day of fishing, the worst night of fishing, to the best night of fishing. Man, two boats full of the brim after they had had nothing all night. Now, how would you react to catching this many fish? I mean, woo! What would you do with all that fish? Would you try to sell it at the market and the grocery stores? I mean, why not? You got all of the fish. Didn't cost you much. <laughs> Other than paying all your workers and... Never mind. Would you take some home and cook it up for dinner? Yeah, definitely. Get, you know, get somebody to fillet it. Then you're ready. Would you have a neighborhood fish fry? I mean, you got a ton of fish. No? I, I would have a neighborhood fish fry. And it would be so good that I'd have bits of oil that had popped on my, on my arms would be so good. I'd scream every time. It'd be great. Or, or would you just leave them all there? Just whatever. Walk away. No? Yeah, that, that seems wasteful, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, Luke chapter 5, verse 11. The last verse we read here today said... When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. Their response to the miracle was to follow Jesus, to learn his teachings, and to care for others just like Jesus cared for them. You know, as you grow older, I think you will probably experience something miraculous in your life. Maybe it's not as big as a huge catch of fish, or maybe it's even bigger. I don't know. Either way, I hope that you will, that when you see it and you experience the miracle, that it will increase your faith and will increase your willingness to follow Jesus even closer. You know, we don't know what happened to the fish at the end, but I'm hoping somebody had a fish fry. Well, let's pray together by repeating our prayer out loud. Our God, we thank, you we thank you for fishing trips, fishing trips and, miraculous catches, and miraculous catches, but mostly for Jesus, mostly for Jesus who, loves us, who loves us and calls us, and calls us to follow him. To follow
Take care of me, my family, my friends, and my church. Amen. Well, thanks, children. I'm going to speak with the adults now. And as always, you can listen in. If you have any questions, though, don't be afraid to ask because we learn by asking questions. Of course. The stage was set for the 1954 World Series between the New York Giants and the Cleveland Indians. It was the first World Series since 1948 that did not feature the Yankees. Hallelujah. And it was the next to last World Series game that would be played in the Polo Grounds in Upper Manhattan, New York City. Going into the eighth inning, the score was tied two to two. And then suddenly, with runners in scoring position, Vic Wirtz hits a deep flaw fly ball screaming into center field, into the furthest recesses of the cavernous center field. Oh, this thing is gonna get extra bases. He's going for a probably an inside the park home run. And the Indians are gonna win. NBC's Jack Brickhouse made the call alongside Russ Hodges. And I'm gonna imitate him. There's a long drive, way back, center field, way back, back. It's a oh my! Caught by Mays! The runner on second Dolly is able to go to third. Willie Mays just brought this crowd to its feet with a catch which must have been an optical illusion to a lot of people. Boy, notice where that 800, 483 foot mark is in center field. The ball itself, Russ, you know this ballpark better than anyone else I know. I had to go 460, didn't it? It certainly did, and I don't see how Willie did it, but he's been doing it all year. Willie, man, he's just made the catch of the day. <laughs> and flashing toward the fence with his back toward home plate. Oh, Willie Mays, the say hey kid, made a miraculous run over the shoulder basket catch to record the out. He planted his foot and threw the baseball back with as much torque that took his hat flying right off and him tumbling to the ground. The crowd erupted and the television viewers were jaw dropped. It's the greatest catch in World Series history, if not all time. And it's my favorite old player with my favorite old catch. The Giants would win game one in the 10th inning after a walk-off three-run homer by the pinch hitter and eventual MVP, Dusty Rhodes. Now, Dusty Rhodes, I remember a different Dusty Rhodes watching basketball growing up with my dad. And the New York Giants swept the series in four straight games to win their first championship since 1933. This spectacular fielding feat of Willie Mays is regarded as one of the greatest plays in baseball history. There's even a YouTube video that describes how impossible it was in great detail. And I watched every moment in preparation for this sermon. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. Even Hall of Famer Willie Mays didn't believe that the catch as he called it, as they called it, was the best defensive play he ever made. Perhaps not, but there was none more consequential than that catch to win the World Series game. Now, I don't know if Jesus ever played baseball, but we do know that several of his disciples were paid to make catches of fish as commercial fishing. Today's passage is set on Lake Gennesaret, also known as the Sea of Galilee, or Lake Tiberias, or Kinneret, or Kinnereth. It's all the same. The Bible has several names for it throughout the Gospels and the Old Testament. The Hebrew word Kinner, K 
K-I-N-N-O-R, transliterated. It means harp or lyre. And scholars think that it's called kinneret because the C looks like a harp. It's in the shape of a harp. Beautiful. It's a lovely lake, calm, picturesque on all sides. It is beautiful. All right, so enough trivia about lakes today. Today's fishing tale describes a miraculous catch of fish, and if Jesus wasn't there to confirm it along with the crowd, no one would believe it. Nobody. With the crowds pressing in to hear Jesus teach, he got into Simon's boat and asked him if he'd put out a little way from the shore. And have you ever wondered why Jesus got into Simon's boat? Well, it wasn't because Jesus hailed the Uber of boats on the Sea of Galilee with his cell phone. Well, it's because there wasn't any fish in it. It was empty. That's why I got into it. There was plenty of seating available. Come on, come on. It's a brand new boat. Looks like they hadn't used it all night. Now, I bet small business Simon was hoping he could at least get a rental fee from the itinerant teacher. But little did Simon know that he was going to get a front row seat with exclusive access to hear Jesus teach all because the fish weren't biting that night. And that's why we call it fishing, not catching. After Jesus' lesson, lesson was finished, he asked Simon to put it out into deep water and then to let down the nets for a catch. Now, here's the catch. They had worked all night and they'd caught nothing. And when Jesus hopped into the boat, they were cleaning their nets on the shore and calling it a day. And nevertheless, at the teacher's direction, which must have been a compelling sermon, right? I mean, the fisherman was listening as, as they were cleaning their nets. Jesus must have been really teaching that he could compel them after calling it a night to get back in and drop the nets in. Boy, I wish I had heard that sermon. But Simon let down his drag nets into the deep, fresh waters of the lake as Jesus instructed. I mean, forget about a measly rental fee for using the boat what happened next was enough to shock and humble. Yes, humble old Captain Simon. Miraculously, they caught so many fish that their nets were starting to break. They even sent them to their partners in the other boat to come help them. And when they came, they filled the fish to the brim and the boats began to sink. Simon and all who were there were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. But when Simon saw it, his reaction was just as miraculous. He fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, just like Isaiah did in the temple of the Lord, when he saw the angel of the Lord, he said, get away from me, Lord. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips, Isaiah said. And the word translated as amazed in Greek could also be translated afraid, as in the fear of the Lord. Simon attempts to send Jesus away from his own sins as an act of reverence and humility. He doesn't want to mire Jesus with his confession. Yet in another stunning twist of events, as Simon falls to his knees trying to send Jesus away, Jesus comforts him and he commissions him. He tells Simon, do not be afraid. But he was amazed. And afraid, it's the same word. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. But Simon is afraid, and he is amazed. You see, in Simon's mind, he's embarrassed. He's embarrassed. And I doubt Jesus was trying to slight him for his empty boat, but Simon was probably already internalizing his failure. He had yet another night of nothing. A long day at work. With really nothing to show for. A fisherman's pride is worn on his waders. You know, it's that slimy smell of the cash crop catch. If you're not dirty and you don't have that twinge and tang of lake life on your clothes, then you're probably not good at what you do. And if you're not dirty and you're not good at what you do, 
then in Simon's mind, he's just a fisherman wearing a painter's white coveralls. He's like a lineman in football with a bright white jersey. That's just wrong, church. That's just wrong. You know, he's had too many no-catch nights in his career. Which makes me wonder if that's exactly why Jesus didn't commandeer his boat. As a thank you for letting him use the boat, Jesus demonstrates his power in an unforgettable moment that dashes Simon's self-disgust in a display of salvage dignity. Simon responds by naming his sinfulness and his unworthiness to be in Jesus' presence. But you see... Jesus was in Simon's boat, not the other way around. Jesus was in Simon's boat. Simon wasn't in Jesus' boat. <laughs> Jesus came to Simon and he surprised him with a message and a miracle and a new mission. You know, so often we think about what we can do for the church and what gifts that we can bring to support the ministry. In fact, we try to connect people with the music ministry and the missions of our church because they have exhibited gifts in those areas. Many Sundays you've heard me pray during the offertory prayer, asking God to give us wisdom to leverage our skills and our talents and our money to help others and invite people to find their place of belonging in this place that we've come to love. And all of that is good and it's helpful and it's certainly worth our conversations and energies. And today's passage reminds us that God uses our failures and God redeems our sins as well. Jesus didn't call Simon and the other fishermen because they were voted best of Gennesaret Lake for seven years in a row. He didn't call them because they exhibited gifts and graces as apostles. Jesus calls them in a time of their bleakness. And Jesus exchanges their discouragement for his encouragement. Jesus swaps their emptiness and their empty nets for an excessively abundant catch of fish. As Dr. Wesley Allen Jr. writes, the moment when we humbly recognize that we have nothing worthy to bring may be the very moment when Christ begins to use us in ways we never could have imagined. Mm. Here's the catch, Judge. When Jesus told Simon that he would be catching people from now on, when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything. They left the boats, they left the nets, they left the miraculous catch of fish that nearly sank two boats, and they followed Jesus. This, these sweet-smelling fishermen, right? They didn't catch anything. These sweet-smelling fishermen probably had cologne still on. Weren't very good at catching fish. So what makes you think they'd be any good at catching people? <sighs> Caught you? Caught you? Caught you? Caught me? Caught you, didn't it? <sighs> Surprise. And my, what a catch.